Uh, welcome back, everyone, to another plan seminar. Today, we welcome Ryan Cotterell back again presenting for us. He was, I think, the first presenter at the seminar series last year. Um, Ryan is an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at ETH Zurich and does research in computational linguistics and natural language processing. And currently, Ryan is running a lecture on large language models, which I'm sitting in. And it's a like a self-contained introduction to language modeling and its applications, and a lot of like the view of language models through a more formal lens. And diving into this classical language modeling frameworks, we will hear today about how to optimally encode probabilistic weighted finite state automatas on RNNs. And to do a little bit advertisement here, Ryan will also give a tutorial this year at ESLI on formal language theory and neural networks. So this talk today is maybe a little bit of a teaser for that. So excited to hear to, from you today, Ryan, and you can take it from Thanks. me. So first I should say uh, thank you to um, my collaborator, uh, Anae Sveta, who's lurking there. Uh, you can see the Anae with the N-A-E-J, but um, <clears throat> he's, he's my co conspirator on this work. But I'll get started. So um, this is going to be a whiteboard lecture. Um, so I'm going to start with this screenshot of a book. And this is a very famous book. It's by Marvin Minsky, Turing Award winner, you know, a pioneer of artificial intelligence. And he has um, a book on computation. Um, and what's interesting here um, is that if we go to this series uh, on um, finite state machines, uh, Sifli and 3.5, we see the equivalence of neural networks and finite state machines. Uh, so I wanted to see what exactly was claimed here. And then this will be a jumping off point for the questions we've asked and what we sort of, um, what we sort of uh, got into. Um, okay, so it says here that he has a theorem, theorem 3.5, every finite state machine is equivalent to and can be simulated by some neural network. Um, now he's dealing with, uh, Minsky is treating sort of an older kind of a finite uh, neural network, one that was based on the original formulation of McCullough and Pitts. These, you know, these sorts of things that people cite but rarely read. And these were more language, uh, these are sort of more uh, traditional formal languages. So the question I'm going to treat in this lecture is what if we had these, uh, what if these were formal um, probabilistic languages, what would we do? So now I'm gonna switch over, hopefully it'll be, uh, simple to my lecture and we'll start uh oh no that's the wrong one we'll see where there we go and hopefully we can switch over so i'll start i'll start asking the question we're gonna get into more formally and then um we'll see where we go okay um so recurrent neural networks and finite state machines okay so um the first question we have to ask of ourselves the first question is what do we mean do we mean by an, I'll use an abbreviation here, RNN. Can you, can you see right now your other screen? Uh, yeah, can you not see it? Is yeah. it? No. Oh. No. Here, you yes, it? you're sharing this. So what do we mean by a recurrent neural language model? That's the first question that we, we care about. And what I mean by this is going to be something akin to an Elman network. Uh, so I'm going to formally define this. Um, and then I guess... Uh, we also have to ask what we have to sort of explain. This is this is uh, the other thing is what we mean. We mean by a PFSA. Um, this is what I mean by a finite state language model. So the goal here, I guess, is to sort of imitate Minsky's theorem. But for the probabilistic case, that is we. So the goal theorem. So this is the de, the the desideratum. You, know, you can't be an academic without using a fancy Latin word. Latin word is um, we want something that says something like R and and LMs are approximately equal to PFSAs. Okay, because that's what Minsky was claiming. Um, so the first thing that we need to talk about is that we're going to work with Minsky's, um, Minsky's uh, definition of an RNA, uh, RNN. Um, and the first thing is to talk about activations. So what activations are you going to consider? So the activation that we care about is going to be, uh, the way I call it, is a heavy side, uh, a heavy side activation. Uh, now heavy side, um, I guess it wasn't until relatively recently, I won't admit when, that I realized that this was actually somebody's name and not some sort of compositional 
I think that's why it's written with a little I there, heavy side. Um, so this is also known as something like hard, a hard uh, nonlinearity. Uh, so a heavy side function, um, and we're going to write this like this, is typically written f of h. Um, the way we're going to write it, although I think uh, is going to be something along the lines of um, um, if x is greater or equal to 0, um, we'll just do greater or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Actually, I'll make this greater or equal. So we have this sort of uh, binary yes or no, um, yes or no neuron. And there's a sense in which this was sort of the original uh, neural network. So when a lot of when people talk about how neural networks are not biologically inspired anymore, uh, one of the complaints um, is the fact that people believe that neurons sort of have this on or off um, sort of uh, quality, but things like sigmoid do not. Sigmoid is actually kind of an approximation to this. So if we plotted this for a second, let me get my, let me just draw a little plot. I can think of uh, a sigmoid, which is a more common nonlinearity, as something like a, so if I think about this heavy side as being, you know, this blue line here, uh, and then I'll put one up here, and then something like this. I can almost think of a sigmoid as, you know, something like, oh, shall I put this in a, in a pink color, something that looks like this. So people move towards sigmoids from this heavy side function uh, because it's differentiable. Um, but this, to understand Minsky's context, he cared about what was sort of the original, the original um, nonlinearity uh, in the McCullough and Pittsburgh, which was uh, this guy here. Okay. Um, so first, uh, what I want to do is I want to convince you um, that something like this sort of has to be finite state. Uh, so imagine that my hidden states, and we'll get into a more formal definition in a second, but imagine my hidden states, uh, I have sort of n neurons in my hidden state. Um, this function here forces everything to be either on or off. So therefore, if I have n hidden states, I have two to the n different vectors. And this means that they're two to the n's big, uh, it's exponential in n, uh, but it's still finite, which means that there's going to be a finite number of hidden states, um, which means I should expect that this, this theorem could be true. Uh, something like this. We're going to see that there are some caveats when dealing with the probabilistic case. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to a formal definition of an R and N. Uh, so we'll say, um, uh, let's, let's define an R and N language model. Uh, so first, um, a lot of my class deals with what we should expect a language model to be. Uh, so I'm going to sort of build up the machinery to get there in the end. Uh, okay, so we're going to say um, an alphabet uh, is a finite non-empty set and we often denote alphabets by sigma, so typically denoted with sigma. Um, we're also, we also denote sigma bar, so sigma bar is going to be defined to be sigma union EOS. And EOS, this is one of the, 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 the weirdest parts about language models. I spent a lot of it on my class because it's criminally sort of underexplored. Um, so EOS, this guy is not a member of sigma. Uh, and it's going to single, signify something like the end of the sequence. Okay, so I have this notation, sigma, sigma bar. This is standard to the work I do. So, you know, uh, if you see any of our papers on this, we use this notation. I don't know if any other authors do. We sort of came up with it because it's very concise, um, because we often want to talk about um, the difference. Okay, so a language model. is a distribution, is a probability distribution over sigma star. So sigma star is called the Kleene closure, and this is going to be this infinite union of sigma to the n, uh, where 
this is again by definition, is the empty string epsilon. And this guy here denotes sort of a Cartesian product. That is to say, sigma to the n equals sigma times sigma n times. So you can see that um, a couple of things stand out. So this, I find this important to reiterate when talking to sort of the younger generation of NLP people, of which I guess maybe I'd be, a, maybe I'm still a part, uh, but there are no infinite strings in sigma star. Nevertheless, sigma star is an infinitely large set. Um, and for many people, this is confusing, especially those who have a more, we'll say, um, less theoretical CS background or less mathematical background. But the way I compare it to is a set like the integers. Infinity is not an integer. There are only finite, integers are by definition finite, but there's an infinitely large number of them. Okay, so here we have a string. Strings are very similar. Uh, so as an example, um, you know, if we have sigma equals AB, uh, then sigma star equals, of course, epsilon A, B, A, 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 B, B, A, B, B, et cetera. That is the set of all strings. Okay. Um, so there's a couple things that's, that is sort of um, hidden here uh, that I, I'm not going to talk about in this talk, but perhaps I could in a future lecture, which is what happens when we say probability distribution over sigma star. What we mean by this is that we've placed all of our probability mass, so it can't leak probability mass to infinite strings, which can happen in some definitions. Um, okay, so now let's get into an RNN language model. Um, so one way of defining, uh, and then we're going to bring this back to EOS, one way of defining a language model is to make use of this guy EOS. So. Defining a language model. So we do this by saying that we have, um, we define, uh, well, a standard sort of technique is by uh, local normalization. So we define the probability of yt given, and I'm going to explain my notation in a second. Um, let me move this over. We're going to define a series of conditionals. So where do each of these live? Um, so let me first explain my notation. When I write papers on this, I use I typically use bold um, symbol. So this is a little italicized bold symbol, but I can't draw in a very bold way. So this little arrow means it should be bold. Um, so what I've defined here, these, these sort of symbols, the, the, the subscripts will be clear, is something where this this guy here is going to be in sigma bar, and this guy here is going to be in sigma star, um, not sigma bar star. So this basically tells you the probability of an X token given a prefix. Okay, so then what we can do is we can define the probability of a string. And I think I want to, can I move this guy up a bit? Yeah, I'm going to move this guy down a bit. Okay, so what I do is I predict every character given the previous one, and then I predict an EOS given the entire string. Um, now I have to be careful here, um, because generally if I just define a series of conditional probabilities like this, I might not actually have a probability distribution. But you're just gonna have to believe me that everything I'm gonna do here is gonna work out, because I'm gonna very specifically choose this such that it's without proof, so that that's true. Okay, so this is a general way um, of defining sort of one common trick uh, for defining a, a language model. Um, and the reason I call it a, a nice trick, uh, it is standard, uh, but there are other ways you could have done it. Uh, the tricky bit here is that whenever we're defining distribution over an infinitely large set, it can be a bit tricky. Whenever we deal with infinity in mathematics, you know, something can go wrong, uh, so you have to be a bit careful. Okay, uh, so let's define um, what I'm gonna call an Elman LM. I'll change colors up just for fun. So we're gonna have an Elman LM. So here, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to define um, 
this as follows. Now recall, I'm going to reiterate the types, because for me at least, when I'm trying to learn something or teach something, the types are very important to make sure I didn't, at least the teacher didn't make a mistake. Um, so again, yt here is in sigma bar, yt bar is in sigma star. Um, okay, so this is going to be defined uh, as follows. I'm going to say that this is going to be the softmax, I'm going to find this term, but I know my audience in the sense that this will not be an unusual function for you. Uh, so I'm going to you write, write it down and define it later. Um, so I'm going to explain what I've, I've done with this notation. Um, so first of all, I'm going to actually write out what I mean by this first. I'm going to say, okay, that this is going to be, I'm going to have a little Actually, I want to make this a bit, make these little square brackets so it doesn't get as confusing. Okay, so I have this here. Um, so how do these, how do I reconcile these two definitions? So softmax here, the one definition I used here, uh, this is going to be a vector to vector map. That is, it's going to take, I'm going to have some matrix here, which I multiply a hidden state. Um, and then um, I select an index. If I break it down in terms of component wise, it looks a bit more like this. Um, where I have an embedding. So this is, you know, this is a dot product between some embedding for YT um, and some hidden state HT. Okay, so this is this is how I define a language model. So I need some, some function E, and E is going to be a function from sigma bar to RD. Uh, and then I need some function to come up. And then I also have, I guess we'll say my HTs are in RD. So this is a real dot product. Um, so this is sort of a generic softmax language model. A lot of models would fit under this, uh, this, um, this description. But what makes something sort of a, an Elman network uh, is the recurrence. So the recurrence, and by which I mean how we determine HT is going to be some function um, F of HT minus one, and possibly also YT minus one. Uh, and this guy here is called the dynamics map. Um, so to be specifically, to be an Elman network, uh, we typically take this to be some sigma, which is a nonlinearity, and this is going to be some U matrix times HT minus one plus some V matrix. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the prime here. I used a prime here just because in the general case, it doesn't have to be the same embedding as this one, although for many, in many places it is. Um, so this is sort of the generic, make this more of a U. This is the generic sort of Elman recurrence. Okay, so this should be a review for most people in this, this, this chat. Um, these are very popular language models a few years ago. I'll make that look more like a U. Um, um, so the goal is to anal analyze the following um, Actually, I should probably say here, this is a, this is a nonlinear function. Um, so the goal um, of this, the goal of this, of this talk is to analyze uh, the following case. Goal to analyze That is when sigma is the heavy side function. So I've sort of said this before, um, but what does this mean? Um, so if we write this out again, um, you know, I say my HT, and I'm going to say that well, this is going to be this heavy side function, um, and it doesn't matter how I choose these other parameters, 
because the range of the heavy side function is zero or one, this is going to live in zero, one to the D. Okay. So let's think about this for a second. Um, I have, I have this idea of a language model um, where I have some recurrent function that's going to keep track of the context. That is, it knows it passes on information from the previous hidden state and it passes on information from the previous token um, and it updates the context. And given this HT, this hidden state, which is a representation of the context, I define a probability over the next token. This could be EOS, in which case I stop or I could keep going, as given by this nice expression, a softmax. Um, so this is sort of a very simple language model. Um, but now that we've sort of decided to analyze this as a heavy side function, I believe some authors like uh, Will Merrill call this the saturated sigmoid or saturated analysis. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that this, at least in this case, is a finite state machine. And indeed, this isn't sort of like a new, this isn't a new, um, this isn't a new observation. I think some of the early work in the 2017 and 18 about how expressive LSTMs were was motivated by the fact that an LSTM um, had uh, was able to pass information outside of nonlinearity, so it should, it could count and therefore do something a bit more expressive. Okay, um, so we're going to come up with a theorem, and we're going to be very careful about what, how we state it. But we're going to come up with a theorem that says these sorts of element RNN LMs with a heavy side function are roughly PFSAs. There's going to be a couple of caveats, which is sort of why this, this gets a bit nuanced. Um, but first, I'll say, are there any questions? I've sort of set the stage before I start getting into the, the actual meat. I have motivated it with, Ch oh, sorry, not Chomsky, Minsky's original presentation. I said, can we do something in, this, in the language model case? One second, I get my window to stop banging. Um, but yeah, are there any, um, are there any questions? OK. Uh, Take that as a no, but you can drop me at any time. Okay, so let's let's see, um, let's see what we can do. Um, okay, so uh, the theorem we want. Um, um, actually, before we get to the theorem, I want to go over a bit of finite state language theory, language model theory. Um, so um, specifically, um, I want to sort of motivate what could go wrong with all of this. Um, so what should be clear to you is that this is a deterministic procedure, right? Given the previous hidden state and given the previous word, I have a unique hidden state I go to, right? This is a function from the previous context in the previous letter to the next context, right? It's a function. So um, what this means in finite state land is that this is representing the deterministic finite state automata to the extent that it is. It's a deterministic procedure. So you might know or recall um, that non-deterministic and deterministic finite state automata are equivalent. Does everyone recall that? <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, What's a little less well known is that that's no longer true. That's no longer true in the probabilistic case. So we're going to see one of our caveats emerging, which is to say, I can come up with a very simple finite state language model that no RNN, or really no deterministic, um, really no deterministic um, model can represent. There's a lot more to say about all of that, but but we'll get there. Uh, okay, so let's start with some definitions. Um, of a finite state machine. So um, an FSA, a finite state automaton, is a, I think it's a quintuple. I might have to edit that number later. So we have sigma, which is an alphabet. Uh, Q is a finite set of states. And what I always quiz my students on is that why is Q not an alphabet? Anyone remember? It, because it can be empty. You could have an empty automaton with no states. An alphabet is a non-empty set. So this is why we say an alphabet of symbols, but a, a finite set of states. These sort of details matter. I once had a, a paper I was writing 
on the theorem, one of my first papers, my, my advisor, Jason, uh, basically found a counterexample, which was patchable, so it wasn't a big deal, but it was based on the empty automaton. Um, it's quite funny, really, that the automaton that accepts no language is different than the one that accepts only the empty string. These little things we rarely think about. Okay, uh, so we have a transition function. And this transition function um, is going to be a relation. Uh, I call it the function of habit, but it's really a relation. And it's a relation from a set of... Uh, it's a relation because I can have more than one symbol. What, what I do is, given the fact that I'm in a state and, a, uh, uh, and I read a symbol, or I emit a symbol, depending on how you view it, I go to another state. Um, and I've done this as a relation because it, it will, uh, in the, especially in the non-deterministic case, be non-functional. I have a set of initial states. Um, and final states. So I should actually modify this definition a bit. Actually, I already have the tools. So I can just make this sigma bar. Uh, sorry, not sigma bar. Um, forgot my special. This should be the general case. This should be sigma epsilon. Okay. So a couple points about this definition and how we relate it to the definitions we had earlier. Um, I'll call this the transition relation. Um, is that the final states, being in the final state and stopping is equivalent to EOS. It's just traditionally in finite state land, we, we talk about um, final states and not EOS, uh, but they're really isomorphic. Um, so I could actually dispense with final states and just have an additional sigma, uh, a sigma bar here and say I admit an EOS, that would be okay. Okay, um, so a fact, uh, so let's do an example first. Um, so an example would be something like this. So here's a very simple automaton. Um, um, so this automaton, I, I start in the start state and I, and I proceed through it and this accepts the language um, A, B, A, C, like so. Um, now, a couple of things about this automaton. First is that it's non-deterministic. So why I say it's non-deterministic is if I'm a state I'm going to label one, I can either go to state two or state three. So I can go either here or here. Um, in general, a simple definition is that a, an, uh, an FSA is deterministic. If it has no epsilon transitions, um, and this is actually very important uh, because the second condition you might think covers it all, but it, it, it doesn't. Um, and is a partial function. I say partial because it doesn't have to be defined everywhere. Um, some authors will define this everywhere. For instance, if you read Sipser, Sipser would say, well, uh, you have to have sort of a dead state so that this is a total function. You always have to be able to go somewhere. Uh, but I don't like that definition because um, in practice, you'd, you'd end up with non-coaccessible uh, states. Or sorry, non-accessible, co yeah, non-coaccessible states. Okay. Um, now, you could have um, a, an automaton with epsilon transitions where this was a function, but we exclude this for a lot of very good reasons, uh, which you'd have to take my other course to find out. Uh, okay, so I have this little, um, this deterministic, and here's a fact. You can even call it a theorem. Should you yeah. have also just one initial state? Or uh, is that implied? Uh, I, I think you can say one initial state. That's a good point. Thanks, Clemente. Uh, so a fact is that any FSA can be determinized. 
Another way of saying this is uh, there exists another FSA, uh, we'll say another deterministic FSA with the same language. Okay. Now here's the part why, why we're sort of building up to this. Now when we talk about finite state language models, uh, what we mean uh, is we're going to take this definition here, uh, and I'm actually just going to copy it to the next, the next sort of page, uh, and then we're going to augment it with a transition, uh, sorry, with a, a probability distribution. So when we talk about probabilistic FSAs, and we'll call these AKA finite state language models. Um, what we do is we make this a sex tuple, or actually we can keep it as a fun sample, but what we do um, is we take this guy here, we erase him, I'll put a little P here, keep it in green, and we come up with a little distribution uh, where we say that the probability of a state um, and a symbol Sorry, I should should race a bit more of this, get these as well. Where we have a probability distribution. which is the, this can be read as the probability of an arc like this. Um, and we typically put this probability, make that a bit nicer. We typically put this probability with a little slash. Uh, so we typically denote this like this. Call that a little p. Um, so this this probability is here, uh, and what we require to sum to one. Um, what we require to sum to one uh, is. Um, the sum of all q. The sum of all a and sigma, and then we also need uh, what's typically called rho. Um, and this is the the probability of stopping. So to complete our definition, why erase these other two? is that rather than have initial states and final states, we now have functions lambda so I'll write this uh, distribution lambda over initial states and stopping probabilities row Now you might say, where did lambda and rho come from? Those are two Greek letters that came out of nowhere. I don't know where they first came from, but I know why they were chosen. Um, that they basically mean left and right. So if you think about starting on the left and then ending on the right, lambda and rho. Okay. Um, so yeah, so what we end up now is we end up with a device. So again, if I wanna copy over my example here,
Um, I'll keep doing my edits in this nice neon green. We would maybe put like three fourths, one fourth. Here it has to be one. Here it has to be one. And then this here would have a row of one. Typically, I'd write that in the state. So I might want to. OK. Uh, I could also put a one here to indicate that I'm starting. OK, so this is a, a, a finite state language model. Um, the famous special case of these that dominated NLP uh, were the um, n-gram language models, but these are more general, um, and it's more useful and easier actually to talk about it in full generality. Okay, um, so here's a fact, and this is sort of a surprising fact, which is not all PFSAs, Are determinizable. And to give you an example of one, So what's up here? Uh, the problem here is that these two states have different uh, weights. Uh, so they're not, uh, which in sort of the, the parlance of the, oh no, this is not, uh, it's a different notebook. They're not in the parlance of the literature, which is that Q1 and Q2 are not twins. Okay, so this is still background, this is known, like this has been known since the 90s, but where does this leave us in sort of coming up with a probabilistic analog of Minsky's theorem? Well, it means that our goal um, is going to have to change because um, the machine that uh, an Elman language model with a heavy side activation is inherently deterministic uh, and it has a finite number of states. There's no way we can ever represent this. So this means that we know that finite state language models are, in a sense, more expressive than um, uh, recurrent neural language models. OK. However, we might want to, uh, we might want to revisit our theorem a bit. So the theorem we're actually going to prove now Heavy side Elman are an Elman language models over the extended reals. And this is something we can relax a bit. It's going to have to leak into a different talk, though. Um, but in case you don't know what I mean by that, I mean the extended reals, which are often also called R bar, is defined to be. The real numbers, union, negative infinity, positive infinity. So why do we need an infinity? The bottom line is that we often want a zero. We can easily put a zero on one of these arcs. But the only way to get a zero out of an x is to have a negative infinity. Uh, there are ways to get around this with slightly, which, you know, what we'd have to remove uh, this x here. And there are proposals like the sparse max that would allow you to get around this. But basically, this is something that's known, which is that Element softmax doesn't do um, doesn't do sparsity, so it doesn't do true zeros. Okay, um, so we have heavy side language models over the Elman, sorry, sorry, heavy side Elman language models over the extended reals. Got myself mixed up. Are equivalent 
to probabilistic deterministic finite state uh, LMs. I'll make these both LMs for consistency. Okay, so the question to ask now before we get into the proof, and then that'll basically conclude uh, the novel. Well, this this is where it gains novel territory from a review, but that'll conclude the, the talk. But I want to make sure everyone understands the statement of the theorem. Does everyone understand the statement of this theorem, like what I'm trying to prove? For every heavy side language uh, element language model, I can construct um, a probabilistic deterministic language model and the other way around. We'll then talk a bit about the optimality question uh, because this was treated um, in the theoretical literature in the 90s quite extensively. So there's actually a known bound um, on, there's actually sort of a known bound on how small the network uh, can, that represents a language model can be. Uh, but what we're going to find, at least what our research currently suggests, is that it doesn't apply to the probabilistic case for all the time, only in special cases. Okay, so what's um, what's 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 with this proof? So one direction is easy. One direction is easy, uh, and that direction is um, encode. So the direction that's easy is encode. Uh, we'll, we'll do it. So encode a heavy side element LM as a PFSA. Why do I say this is easy? So um, suppose our HT lives in 0, 1 to the D. Um, then we create an FSA, we'll say a PFSA, with two to the D states, one for each HT. Um, and if we have a transition, um, I'll write it like this. Um, So I want to make sure this matches my earlier definition, so I'm going to go back a second. Yeah, okay, so recall, let me um, let me just copy this guy over here. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong tool. Let me just copy this guy over. Um, so recall this. Um, then note that we have a unique state here for this HT minus one and this HT. So what we have to do is I'm going to label the states like so. And this is going to have my y, uh, and this is going to be the weight. Is this is going to be p of y given? Um, I'm just going to use notation slightly and write this. Um, and then every state is going to be a final state, where the final state weight, which I can write here, um, would be the probability of EOS given ht. So I basically enumerate all of these two D states, and I put the probabilities on the arcs. That that's actually a very simple construction. It's a bit of a sketch here but I can give you a very formal treatment in my class notes if you wanted to see more details. Um, okay, uh, so now the remaining 10 minutes will go to the hard direction. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, so the cool thing here 
is that um, given a PFSA with Q, um, uh, we'll say over alphabet over alphabet sigma with Q states, um, reconstruct with O of hidden units. So before we get into the technical details, I want to sort of philosophize about what this is saying. What this is saying um, is kind of interesting because this gets this this um, this gets into the the sort of the optimality question. So I'm going to put a little aside over here, back on my previous page. Uh, so what we have here is that we have. Um, L and L M with D hidden units. With two to the D states. So we have an exponential blow up in the number of states when we go one way. Um, so this is important because there do exist. And in fact, John Hewitt gave an example of one based on the bounded Dyke languages in 2000. Uh, 20. There do exist languages where you can uh, exponentially compress a finite state machine into a cleverly chosen RNNLM. However, that's not always the case. And this is where we get into the optimality question, which we're, what we're saying in general, uh, we need linear space in the original. However, there do exist spe special cases where we can really compress them, but in general, we can't. Okay, so let's talk about how we do this construction. Um, so the steps work like this. Um, our goal um, or sorry, the first uh, our goal is to have a one hot encoding of Q slash sigma. So this is where the bound comes in. So that means every entry in the hidden state, for instance, um, if I have a hidden state like this, I'm going to say it's, it should be one hot and I should maintain this property. So say I have some zeros. This guy right here tells me a Q pair. Okay, um, and here is the trickiness. This is sort of the only trickiness of the proof, which is how do I transition? Uh, so suppose this were true, uh, and we want to make sure it remains true. So that means we want something that looks like this. We want to say that, well, we have this recurrence. So I've introduced a bias term. Um, how do we define these guys? Um, so what you do is our, uh, the, the trick here is to sort of break up this encoding uh, of how did the transition the two parts. So why is this not immediately obvious? Um, so um, what's encoded here is actually the previously admitted symbol. That's two symbols ago. Uh, this is the symbol you just admitted, so maybe one symbol ago. Uh, so this matrix here contains all, this, or this embedding here has all the information about the symbol. 
And this matrix or this embedding here, this embedding has all the information about the symbol and this one has all the information about the state. So what we do is we define a matrix U and U lives in, and it doesn't have to be, these matrices don't have to be Boolean at all, but we can just make them Boolean. So U is going to live in Uh, sigma Q times Sigma Q. And the goal is we want the following property. If there exists an arc Q to Q prime, I'll put a, a Sigma here for a while. So I'll put a, a B here for any B. in the input PFSA. So here's where um, I've abused notation a bit. What I have to do here is I have to say that every entry uh, that encodes Q to Q prime so every every row that encodes Q, uh, sorry, every every column that encodes um, Q and every row that encodes Q prime has to get a one, otherwise zero. So what this is saying is that I want to have, if I have a state here and this state, this hidden vector. Um, is one hot, so it's going to have an encoding of some Q. And then I want to multiply it by this matrix. And what I want to come out here is a multi-hot vector where every possible state that you can go to from Q on any symbol is lit up. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, that's half of the puzzle. And the other half is V has to be defined analogously. So over here, V, we need V to be V is going to be in sigma times Q times sigma. So this guy over here is going to be a one hot encoding of sigma. And what V is going to do is we're going to say VQA equals one if there exists, so I'm going to put a prime here for symmetry, VQ prime A equals one if there exists a Q A Q prime for some Q. That is, if there exists a start state from which I can take a Q and end up in Q prime. Okay. Um, now B, this guy, so B equals negative one. So it's a vector of negative ones. And of course this lives in um, well, it, it's going to be a We'll just say this is going to live in the reals of um, sigma q because I put I put the booleans here, but they really they really could be real. I mean, they, they happen to be booleans, but they, for the, all intents and purposes, they're reals. Um, okay, so if I choose these matrices in this way, what what peculiar property pops out? This guy right here. Um, there's going to be a lot of entries. Well, there's only three values that this can take, right? Three values. Um, one value is it could be negative. Sorry. So one value could be negative one. 
How can it become negative one? If both of these result in zero, then this guy is negative one. Another value is zero. It's zero if one of these is one, the other is zero, either one, and then we add in this and it's, it's negative one. The final value is one because both of these are one and then we subtract one for this. So what's happened here is because, and this is the whole trick, because it's deterministic, there is exactly one value where these two have two. And therefore this subtracts off one. So the heavy side makes everything zero except for one. And that's really the trick. It's, it's basically encoding an and, a logical and using a heavy side function. And that's really it. That's, the, that's what Minsky came up with in his book. And we were to translate it to the probabilistic case. Uh, the caveats here, again, I haven't quite told you how to put, the, I guess I haven't quite told you how to put the weights on the arc, but that's relatively simple. It's just the probability of this. And the EOS is the final state. This is this logical end is the state. And then um, we do need to deal with infinities in the sense that if we want to have a true zero, like we have a probability of zero, we need to put a zero on the, um, on the arc, which requires an egg infinity. Um, so to wrap up, and then we're going to talk about, I'm going to state the optimality question. Um, the theorem that we ended up proving for the language modeling case is heavy side element LMs over the extended reals are equivalent to probabilist deterministic finite state LM. Uh, we can push back on this with something like the sparse max to get a true zero, but that's sort of the statement. Um, and this is, this is a relatively deep, there, there's actually a lot to say about things like this. So it turns out uh, that you could probably come up with, um, you can probably come up with something like um, uh, a rational valued uh, language model that does this. However, the fact that most language models are deterministic is something that's very hard to get around because the fact that not all probabilistic FSAs are determinizable, that actually goes up the Chomsky hierarchy. We know that not all context or grammars are determinizable. That's true in the unweighted case. So of course it's going to be true in the weighted case. But what we've recently been running up against is the fact that probabilistic Turing machines can't be determinized either. Uh, that is, they represent a smaller class of distributions. So um, there's a lot more to say about this and I don't really have it all worked out yet. But there's, there's sort of a lot of there, there's quite possibly a lot that we've given up in terms of representations just by the fact that uh, language models are deterministic. Um, and to contextualize this, when we talk about classic results like the Ziegelman and Sontag result, uh, Hava Ziegelman's result fundamentally uh, proved Turing completeness in the sense that they, they argued that if you had, um, if you have a, a, a two-stack PDA, which is Turing complete, a deterministic one, which is Turing complete, uh, you can compute that function. That is to say, you can come up in the language modeling case, what this means is I can construct a distribution which has the same zeros on the same strings that are not accepted in that language. But it's not actually modeling a distribution. Once we, once we switch over to talking about distributions over strings, things get a bit complicated. Okay, so now I want to I want to end with a somewhat open question. In fact, Ane and I have largely closed it. Um, so this is the optimality question. Should be an O. So given. number of hidden, uh, Hollis number of neurons, size of hidden state, um, and there was a famous result here that for some, so there are some cases, um, sorry, my laptop's a bit dying, let me plug this in. Um, are some cases where I need but index said 
this is the same. This was actually Pyotr Indyk at um, MIT's master's thesis says, um, you always need at most Uh, sigma times root Q. And our question was, can we extend this? Or how does this generalize to the probabilistic case? Okay, uh, so that sort of concludes the lecture. I guess it was exactly an hour. Are there any questions? What have you found so far? Like you, you said you and... Um... Yeah, the, the result is negative. Nothing generalizes. But we can prove <laughs> that it doesn't. And we can, give, we can characterize when it does generalize. So we can, we can give stronger results than just a counterexample. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Is there a couple of new faces? I might um, end the recording here. So that people might feel more comfortable asking questions. Well, thank you for your presentation. Stop the recording.